Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor uh, Nikos Macris from the Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Professor Nikos will be our uh, warrant uh, distinguished lecturer. Uh, and uh, Professor Nikos is an internationally recognized expert in structural earthquake engineering and structural mechanics and dynamics. Uh, he is the Eddy Family Centennial Professor in Civil Engineering at the SMU, SMU in Dallas, Texas. Professor Macri has also received his PhD and Master of Science from the, uh, from the State University of New York at Buffalo, uh, here in the U.S. And also he holds a diploma in Civil Engineering from the uh, National Technical University of Athens uh, in Greece. And, uh, he has previously served as faculty of the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, uh, for the University of California in Berkeley, uh, University of Patras in Greece, and the University of Central Florida. Uh, he has published more than 130 papers in archival journals, while he has served as, as uh, has supervised 15 PhD theses and more than 40 master theses and 50 year uh, diploma theses as well. He also served as the editor of the Journal of Earthquakes and Structures, uh, the associated editor for the Journal of Engineering Mechanics, uh, and the chair of the Dynamics Committee uh, of the same journal. He's also a member of the Academia Europea, the Academy, the Academy of Europe, and uh, he's a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers, us. Uh, he was also a distinguished visiting fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in the United Kingdom, and uh, he's a member of the uh, uh, Congress Committee and General Assembly of the International Association of Theoretical and uh, Applied Mechanics. He also was honored by, with several international prizes, uh, including the George W. Hausner uh, Structural Control and Monitoring Medal, the J. James R. Cross Medal, both from ASI, the Walter L. Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize from ASI as well, and the TK Aishi uh, Award from the Institution of Civil Engineers in the United Kingdom. Uh, and also the Shah Family Innovation Prize for Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, the EERE in the US. And also he was recipient of the Career Award from NSF. Uh, during the years of 2003 and 2009, Professor Macris uh, has served as the director of reconstruction of the Temple of Zeus in the Ashait Nemea in Greece. And uh, he just gave a very interesting presentation to our students here that where he mentioned about uh, his work on the reconstruction of this temple. Professor Macris, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Ketson, for the kind introduction. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, as I said earlier in my graduate student seminar, it's, a, it's an immense pleasure to be here. It's the first time I, I'm in Minneapolis, uh, although I have been in the States since uh, 88. I had the pleasure to have uh, colleagues and uh, uh, collaborators who have either graduated from here or they have taught here, so it's really nice to be here. So thank you for the kind invitation and for sponsoring this lecture. Um, let's see how I'm going to go here. Uh, yeah. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, urban resilience and how we can quantify it. Um, so the motivation is that our cities will continue to house the majority of the world's population at an increasing rate in association with the face of climate change. So I felt not, not that far ago, like three, four years ago, that we, there, there's a need to develop a science-based framework of analysis for the dynamics and response of cities when subject to natural hazards. And perhaps this model have also some predictive capabilities. So we study and quantify urban resilience by examining the response history of large American cities. So what I'm going to talk today and the conclusions I'm going to reach are for large American cities with average to high population density. Okay. 
uh, prior and upon subject to natural hazards. And uh, I'm also going to show you a, a mathematical model that predicts exactly what our records show. So I would like to make some acknowledgments. Uh, um, we first uh, received some uh, seed funding from a, a data cluster that uh, was created at SMU. Reza Mohimi was my postdoc at that time, and we start uh, exploring these concepts that I'm going to present. And because we use uh, uh, GPS location data from cell phones, so time, latitude, and longitude, we had to deal with uh, uh, a very large uh, amount of data that we have to process them through supercomputers. So we have to somehow collaborate with people from the Office of Information Technology. So Eric Godat and Tuevu are our uh, uh, people from the Office of Information Technology at SMU. Um, so the idea of uh, studying uh, uh, resilience of cities to earthquakes is not new. Uh, the idea goes back uh, more than 20 years ago. There's a group at Buffalo le led by Michel Bruno and Andre Reinhorn that uh, they, uh, they did some uh, interesting work on uh, how to um, quantify and uh, assess uh, the losses uh, from earthquake damage and somehow uh, relate this to urban resilience. What I'm going to talk today is something totally different. I, I borrow concepts from uh, statistical mechanics, from physics, and the quantitative theory of Brownian motion. Um, so as I mentioned, there is a pressing challenge of urbanization. So until uh, 1950, less than 30% of the world's population uh, we're living in cities. Uh, in 2016, we cross the 50% mark. And by 2050, more than three quarters of the world's population will be living in cities. Right. Uh, now, in addition that uh, many of our cities are uh, built by the shore, so they are exposed to hurricanes. Uh, Shores are also uh, the boundaries of our tectonic plates that generate earthquakes. So many of our major cities will not only see uh, hurricanes, but also earthquakes as natural hazards. So the, these are the, mazy, the basic motivation for uh, looking into this problem and trying to quantify urban resilience. And I shall give a definition of what is urban resilience according to what was offered by Stanley Holling. Stanley Holling was an eminent uh, a Canadian ecologist. So he distinguished between engineering resilience and ecological resilience. So engineering resilience hinges upon the ability of a system to assume stable equilibrium or steady state response equilibrium and in this case, resilience is defined as the capacity of the system following a disturbance shock to recover its initial equilibrium state. So simply said, you have a system that has some kind of a steady state response equilibrium. Right? There is a shock that disturbs the steady state response. And resilience is the ability of the system to revert to its pre-shock response. So this is engineering resilience, and this is what we're going to use. Now, <coughs> our cities are complex networks, or even networks of complex networks. So and their functionality is uh, served by the superposition of this transportation network, water network, gas, pipe, electricity, grid, and so on. And these networks have been developed at different times during uh, different design principles and upgraded by different engineers with different design principles. So 
In theory, they have nothing in common, right? Yet, our cities display a difficult to interpret self-organizing behavior that leads to deterministic patterns that can be possibly described with an emergent mechanism yet to be identified. So this is what I'm going to try to do today, to see how is it possible to describe this emergent regularity of our cities. Um, now, in addition to these uh, material electricity and electronic networks, perhaps the most robust network that serves urban resilience is the living network of the citizens, so basically you. Right? Since cities are essential, the physical manifestation of the daily interactions of its citizens, facilitating the generation of creativity, go, uh, growth, progress, and leadership together with economic, intellectual, and social wealth. So what I'm plotting here, there are five lines, a red one, a blue one, a purple one, a black one, and a green one, which are the uh, GPS locations of five citizens, of five cell phone IDs, anonymous IDs in the greater Dallas area. And you see that each of these IDs has its own purpose. Uh, people are going to work, they're driving their children to school, they go to a yoga lesson, and so on, right? So each of these paths may be looked as deterministic paths. But if, if instead of looking at five IDs, you look at 5,000 IDs, this becomes similar to a random process, the motion of 5,000 citizens in a metro. Right? So we're going to uh, adopt this uh, uh, approach that this the motion of our citizens is a random process, but we need to define a metric. So in order to find what? In order to find what is this uh, steady state response of a city now in equilibrium. Right? We need, first of all, to define the steady state response of a city in equilibrium, and then from there on to see if we can build on that concept and quantify resilience. So to do that, we need a metric. And the metric is the displacement of a citizen from its home at the top of every hour. So we identify the home of an ID user, of a cell phone user. And how would I define the home is look at the data and you see the most, the most occupied places between 1 AM and 4 AM. Most likely, this person is at home, right? unless he's a, a hard-working graduate student or a nurse or an Uber driver, right? Most people are in bed between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. And then we measure at the top of the hour, like 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., where they are. So this is the longitude, this is the latitude, and this is the distance r, right? And we use as a metric the square of the distance of each citizen fro from its home. This is our metric. And uh, we plot, for instance here, the latitude, the east-west, which is x, motion of uh, several IDs. And you see that some IDs move more or less to the same, to the east and to the west. But some IDs only go from their home to the east. Maybe they live somewhere, they go to work and come back, and they don't do anything else, right? So it is impossible to infer information for the whole ensemble by looking at one ID. Uh, so we cannot look into uh, time average. We have to look into ensemble average, right? So for those who are not familiar with uh, stochastic processes, if you want to find, um, if you look at the uh, vibrations of the tip of the wing of an airplane, right, uh, du during the turbulence as the airplane flies, 
uh, you don't have to look to a thousand wings. You just look at one wing because this is more or less the same what happens to every wing, right? So you can look only to time averages and not to ensemble average because the, this process uh, is, um, uh, let, me, let me show you here. Uh, oh, I have the same problem here, maybe like this. So the, the vibration of the wings of airplane is a stationary process, and you can look into time average. This, this is not a stationary process, so we have to look to ensemble average. Right? So what we do here is we have uh, time. Uh, so these are the top of the hour, and these are IDs, and these are the displacements at each time. And we average over IDs. We average over IDs, that means we average over this direction rather than over time. This average is called an ensemble average, right? And uh, then we take this R, we raise it to square, and we take the average of the square of the displacement of all the IDs, and we create what is known as the mean square displacement. The mean square displacement is the, the, the sum of the square of the displacement of all the IDs divided by the number of IDs. And this is now is a time history. It's a time history, right, that involves a large number of IDs, those IDs who appear at the top of the hour. So for, we distill, let's say, 3 million IDs, and we distill like 40,000 people who have their cell phone on all the, all the time. And we plot this. So. This is the time history of the mean square displacement from the city of Miami in 2020 that nothing bad has happened under normal conditions. And you have this time history here. And this time history contains two frequencies. It contains a daily frequency, so each spike is a daily frequency. And each dot here is, uh, is a Sunday, so there's also a weekly frequency. So there are two frequencies. Now, from this time history, uh, one can see some interesting information. So for example, more people are moving during the weekdays than during the weekends. Of course, people during the weekends, they stay at home, you know, watching football or having barbecues. But also, less people are staying at home during the weekends than during the, the week. So during the weekends, uh, people have a tendency to visit friends, go camping. So less people are staying at home during the weekends, right? Um, and uh, the same pattern happens if one sees the, MS, the mean square displacement of a different city. So this is the city of Jacksonville. Why I choose these cities? Because these cities will be of interest to me when I'll use hurricanes, because these cities have been uh, struck by hurricanes. And you see exactly the same pattern. So it's a very stable uh, pattern with two frequencies. More people are moving during the week. Less people are at home during the weekends. But also, there is a more interesting information. You see that this mean square displacement is a stable function that is like a Swiss clock. So whereas each one of you are the authors of your own actions, right? So every day you decide to do something, right? One day you go to grocery shopping, the other day you're going to visit a friend. Our collective future is known. So our collective, so if this is the present here, our future, our collective future is known. It has, it has crystallized the tomorrow, waiting patiently to become the next present. Right? Our collective future. Unless something bad happens. So this is the mean square displacement from the city of Dallas. So this is February. And then on February 14th, 2021, we had this uh, unprecedented winter storm. Maybe for Minnesota standards, it's not unprecedented, but for Dallas standards, it was. 
Uh, more than 6 million people were left without power. Uh, more than uh, uh, three dozen people died, including babies from hypothermia. And uh, this storm lasted only six days. And uh, on uh, Saturday, the storm went away. And uh, when we plot the mean square displacement, immediately after the storm was gone, the city of Dallas recovered its pre-event activity. So this Sunday here is as tall as this Sunday here, as tall as this Sunday here. And you see that the mean square displacement after the storm is exactly the same or even more vibrant than the mean square displacement before the storm. So if we go back to Holling's definition of what is resilience, it's exactly this. You have a system that has a steady state response at equilibrium, and it's a measure of its engineering resilience is the ability to revert back to its pre-event response upon a shock happens. And we see that upon the shock happens, the city of Dallas immediately reverts to its pre-event response. So this was a very intriguing result to me because it indicated that there's some kind of an inherent resilience to this large metroplex. And then I said, okay, let's look at the city of Houston. And uh, we did the same thing. So this, this is the city of Houston. This is the box around the city of Houston for, this is uh, 2000, uh, yes. Uh, let me see, because I have two data here. The, 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 this is for the winter storm. The, this is for Harvey, okay, August 17. Yes, this is February 21. The, this is for the winter storm. We got all this, uh, uh, million of IDs, we distill them, those that they appear at the top of the hour, and you see that the mean square displacement of the city of Houston is uh, almost uh, identical to the mean square displacement of this city of Dallas, because the city of Houston has also suffered the winter storm. Uh, the only difference is that the mean of the mean square displacement in Houston is more than Dallas, because uh, uh, Dallas is to get the fourth world is a more spread out metroplex. And again, the city of Houston, immediately after the winter storm, it reverted to its pre-event activity. So my question, the question that I asked myself is, can we develop a mathematical model for that? I mean, ca can we predict this with some mathematical model? So the the, the answer that I'm going to give you is rooted in uh, statistical mechanics. And I'm going to take you back to uh, the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, back in uh, around uh, 1820, uh, a British, uh, a Scottish botanist named Robert Brown was observing the motion of pollen immersed in water. And to his surprise, he saw that pollen grains were uh, moving within water. Uh, to give you an idea, Robert Brown was a contemporary of Beethoven. Right? So Beethoven was born uh, 1770. This was the romantic period. Another time people thought, maybe, you know, these pollen grains are alive and they're chasing each other to reproduce. Right? But then Brown did some experiments with very fine grains of chalk immersed with water, and he saw the same thing, that these fine grains are moving. So this was a mystery, and was remained as Brownian motion. And it's something like this. I don't know if this is going to play, but maybe this is going to play. So this is more or less it's a graphic representation of the random motion of the pollen grains immersed with water. right? Now, this problem was remained unsolved for 70 years until 1905. A young physicist looked into that, named Albert Einstein, and he, he gave an... Einstein was believing in the existence of atoms and molecules. Nobody was believing in the existence of atoms back then. Einstein was believing in the existence of atoms and molecules, and he said that maybe these pollen grains are being bombarded 
by the molecules of the water. And this is why they are moving. And he knew that this was a, a stochastic process because each pollen grain is being bombarded by 10 trillion molecules per second. So he uh, looked at a certain volume of water, right? And he looked how the density of the grains of pollen are, is changing during time, right? So he essentially solved a diffusion equation. And the solution for diffusion equation is uh, Gaussian, right? And uh, the denominator of the exponential is two times the variance. So he ended up with this very simple result uh, that the variance, be, the, the, this is a zero, a zero mean process, right? So the variance is uh, the mean square displacement minus the square of the mean. But because the mean is zero, the, the variance, the mean square displacement, is two times some coefficient, diffusion coefficient times time. N is the number of dimensions. So I try to look at the 1D problem, so N is 1. If you look at the 3D problem, N is 3, right? So this is a remarkable result. So basically what Einstein found that if you have a handful of pollen grains and you throw them in water, these are going to agitate and they're going to disperse. And the mean square displacement grows linearly with time. Right? This is what he said. Grows linearly with time. So in, in stochastic processes, uh, stochastic processes that have a zero mean, and a variance equal proportional to time are known as winner processes, right? So if you want to learn about Brownian motion, you open a book, they say, oh, Brownian motion is a winner process. Go learn, go learn a winner process, right? But Einstein did much more than saying that Brownian motion is a winner process. What is, that, 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 that is a process that has a zero mean and a variance equal, proportional to time. He also showed that this diffusion coefficient d, right, which is a, a coefficient that comes from a stochastic process, right, it's a stochastic quantity, the diffusion coefficient, is related to the mobility of the fluid particles. So let me, let, let, let me, uh, yeah, I'll do this next slide. So basically, he replaced d with do, don't worry about this. The, the, these are constants. This is KB's Boltzmann constant, and T is the temperature of the fluid. The hotter is the fluid, the more the molecules are agitated. So he basically related the mean square displacement that is um, a process, that, that's a quantity from a stochastic process, to the mechanical mobility that is uh, a quantity, a deterministic quantity. So Einstein, for the first time, he creates a bridge between randomness and determinism. This is a very important step in scientific reasoning. Now, the mobility is, uh, is force over velocity. Maybe some of you do signal processing. In electrical engineering, they use the inverse. It's called impedance. The impedance is the inverse of the mobility. So let me tell you essentially wha what is this so-called uh, Einstein-Stokes equation. So way before, Stokes looks to a problem where you have a water or a fluid and a sphere with radius r moving slowly with a velocity v. OK, here's interesting this problem. So we have a sphere with radius r within a Newtonian fluid with viscosity eta and density rho moving slowly, in a slowly, so no inertia effects, in a fluid with viscosity. Right? So he wanted to find wha what is the drag. So the drag is something, some coefficient that we don't know. But the rest, you can calculate with dimensional analysis. So because this moves slowly, there are no inertia effects. So density is not going to play a role. And the answer is, uh, R eta V. If you do, so 
if you do the, the dimensions, the, this is force, this is length, this is uh, the viscosity is uh, uh, pascals, which is, it is, it is pascals times uh, time, this is the velocity. And the answer, and then he solves the equation, and this quantity here is 6 pi. But the 6 pi comes from solving the differential equations. This comes from the dimension analysis. So the mobility m, which is v over f, right? v over f is what? Is 1 over 6 pi r et. Okay. So this is Stokes result for a sphere moving slowly. So Einstein took the Stokes result. 1 over 6 pi r eta. He added it here, and he presented this very elegant formula where the mean square displacement is t over eta so times a constant. But t over eta is something that's very well known to us. It is the creep compliance of a viscous fluid. So if you have a dashpot, and you have here the time response functions, the creep compliance is t over eta. So, now we have this beautiful result that from statistical mechanics, the mean square displacement of a, a collection of Brownian particles of pollen grains is equal to a constant times the creep, com the creep compliance of the fluid within which they are immersed. That's fantastic. You have randomness. And here you have determinism. But Einstein, by solving this diffusive equation, this solution is a long-term solution. There is no inertia, as we said. There are no inertia effects. So people were very interested in this problem because at that time there was a big desire to understand the, the fabric of matter. There was a big fight between people to understand if atoms really exist. right? So another very famous physicist, contemporary of Einstein, Paul Langevin, looking at this problem, and he looking at this problem by developing a whole new way of the, a, new, a, whole, a whole new dynamics called Langevin dynamics. So Langevin was a big believer in Newtonian mechanics. So he said, let me look at this problem by do writing f equal ma. So he said the, the acceleration of the particle is going to be the sum of the forces. These are the random forces, which is the bombardment of the molecules. And this is the drag. This is basically this equation here, right? But Langevin presents a very intriguing equation where the excitation from the molecules is a stochastic force. But then the drag, which essentially more bombardments on the pollen grain as the pollen grain is moving, he reverts to continuum mechanics. So basically, the genius of Langevin is that he mingles stochastic mechanics and continuum mechanics. One term is from stochastic mechanics. And then all of a sudden, Sunday, he says, oh, I changed my mind. The drug is going to be from continuum mechanics. But then this equation can be integrated in terms of ensemble average. And uh, this was done by another physicist la later on. And this is the result for the mean square displacement. Now, the mean square displacement, here you have all time scales. You have inertia. And the result is the same thing, 1 over t over eta. So oh, until here, you have a stand result. And here, here you have a correction to account for inertia. And this is called the ballistic regime. By the way, this equation was solved by uh, one of other famous physicists at the beginning of the century, Leonard Ornstein, a Dutch physicist. Uh, so I was very intrigued from uh, the result by Einstein that uh, the mean square displacement is something times the creep compliance of the fluid. So I said, is this, is this function here? one over eta times this function, the creep compliance something else. Because now we have the inertia, right? 
So I said, can I come up with a mechanical model that the script compliance is this? Because I want it to revert back to this equation here. OK? This has no inertia and is a creep compliance of the viscous fluid. This has inertia. Is there a mechanical model that this, is, that this function is creep compliance? And the answer is yes. So the answer is that it's merely a dashboard with an inerter. So what is an inerter? An inerter is a mechanical element that is force output is proportional to the relative acceleration. So a spring is a mechanical element that is force output is proportional to the relative displacement. A dashboard is a mechanical element that the force output is proportional to the relative velocity. An inerter is a mechanical element that the force output is proportional to the relative acceleration. And maybe this sounds unfamiliar, but all of you have played with an inerter. So a driving spinning top is an inert. Right? Maybe you have played this when you were young. So if you combine these two things in parallel, it so happens that the creep compliance is precisely this. So we publish this at, in physical review E after establishing a viscous viscoelastic correspondence principle for Brownian motion. So anyway, to make a long story short, so now uh, I had that the same result that the mean square displacement is something times the creep compliance of something, of a mechanical model. And it turns out that you can play the, ga the same game for more complicated fluids, like viscoelastic fluids, right? Now, in viscoelastic fluids, things are more complicated because the Langevin equation is mass times acceleration to the sum of the forces. These are the random forces, but you no longer have the Stokes drag force. You have a convolution integral to take account of the memory of the elastic forces of the viscoelastic fluid, right? You have, so you have something more complicated. But this is still a linear equation, and you can solve it in, uh, by doing a Laplace transform. I mean, the mathematics are pretty. Uh, so some of this work was done by a group at Princeton in the late 90s that were working in microareology. And it turns out that even for viscoelastic fluids, you have exactly the same answer. That the mis if you have Brownian motion in viscoelastic fluid, the mean square displacement of the Brownian particle is a constant times the creep compliance of what? Of a mechanical model that is the viscoelastic fluid within which the, gray, the, the pollen grains are immersed in par with an inerter. Okay. So this is now is a fascinating result that was telling me what? No matter how complicated is the way that the Brownian particles exchange forces with the material that they are immersed, so the Einstein solution is if they ex exchange only viscous forces. The solution of the Langevin equation is if you ex exchange viscous and inertia forces. Even if you have now viscous, inertia, and viscoelastic forces, you have exactly the same answer. Right? So this relationship has an overarching validity. Right? So I am going to skip something here that because I'm running out of time. And I'm going to go here, which essentially summarizes what I say. So no matter what is, how complicated is the mechanism that the Brownian particle exchange forces with the surrounding fluid, Yolo has had re these relations. That the mean square displacement is a constant times the creep compliance of a mechanical model that you have to identify. So I said, OK. Maybe I can make a conjecture and borrow this expression for my cities. So I said, OK, so these are, these are now the motion, not of brown and part, but of citizens, right? And I'm saying that the mean square displacement is a constant times j of t. j of t of what? Something that I need to find. But I have the mean square displacement. So, so the green line here is a recorded mean square displacement for, for, for Dallas, right? So this is what is, is, is what is an elevated is an elevated oscillation 
it never touches the bottom because we said that, you know, you have always nurses, Uber drivers. So the city, our cities never sleep, right? So they never touch zero. So the first thing that comes in mind to create an elevated vibration is a spring that is connected in series with a spring and an inerter, and you get this black line. So I can capture the daily frequencies, but I could not capture the weekly frequencies, right? And then I gave up with uh, putting in series and in parallel springs and dashboards because I remember, maybe now the young generation that listens music from uh, iPod, they don't know this, but during my days, we had uh, FM and AM. So AM stands for amplitude modulation, and amplitude modulation is exactly this. So this is an amplitude modulation signal from radio communications. And I borrow this signal, right, for, to match the mean square displacement. And it's this black line. And you see how well it matches the mean square displacement of Dallas. I capture the, week, the daily oscillation of the weekly oscillation. And this, uh, they have two constants, C and gamma, that I just have to match here. OK, so now, now have a function for my crimp compliance. If you have a function for your crimp compliance, you have all you need. Because the impulse response function of a mechanical system is the time derivative of the crimp compliance. And you keep going. So, and this is what I did. So let me go here, that is more interesting. And here a small marvel happens, right? So this is my city under normal condition, right? Described by this equation, this amplitude modulation model, right? And uh, I take my city and I subject to a rectangular pulse. The rectangular pulse is the shock, right? And this is the response of, oh, I'm sorry. Maybe. Maybe here. Yeah, maybe one more. And this is the response of the city due to this shock, only due to the shock. So the response of the city after the shock will be the superposition of what happens because of the shock plus what the city wanted to do to begin with, right? This is the response of the city under normality, right? It's like in dynamics. If you have dynamic system that oscillates and you apply a shock, the response after the shock is what it wants to do anyway, plus the disturbance, right? And uh, so this is the mathematical expression of the shock. This is the, the response. And if you add this, which is the response of the city just because of the shock, right, to the, to the response of the city that you want to do all the way. So you see here you have a heavy side function, and here you have a heavy side function, and here you have a heavy side factor that has been delayed. So this, with this is going to cancel. And to make a long story short, if you add this, which is this, and this, which is this, you get a result that's exactly as this, just delayed by T excitation. So my mathematical model predicts exactly what the data say. Okay. It's amazing. So let me go here. And so, and then I said, okay, maybe the winter storm in Dallas is not that bad of a disturbance. Let's go to something more important. So I had data down to 2017. So this is from Hurricane Harvey in Houston. So Hurricane Harvey, uh, it was a huge blow to southern Texas. Uh, it created uh, about a hundred billion of losses. These were the area photographs for several days in Houston. But look at the mean square displacement. So this is the mean square displacement of Houston in 2017. Of course, this is 2017, so we have less rich data. So now I have 1,200 IDs, 1,600, 1,100, 1,200. But you see the response prior to the shock and the response after the shock are carbon copies. Most importantly, immediately after Hurricane Harvey, again, within 
within le less than a day, the metroplex of Houston. I'm not looking at its visual communities. The metroplex of Houston reverts back to its pre-event activity. So this is the calibrated model. And then if you apply this, you find exactly the same answer. So the red is the city of Houston as recorded. The black is the response of my model. Anyway, I'm running out of time. We did the same thing for Hurricane Irma in Miami. Again, the same results. But let me go here to the conclusion. So today, I presented to you two things. So one thing is that I just present you data, right? Evidence from data. And this can be embraced within what we call an inductive reasoning. So what is inductive reasoning? Inductive reasoning is you do a specific observation. So my initial observation, I look at the mean square displacement of Dallas, right? And I noticed that after the winter storm, Dallas reverted back to its pre-event activity. And then I say, maybe I should look to more data. And then you do a pattern recognition. So this is Dallas to the winter storm. This is Houston to the winter storm. This is Houston to Hurricane Harvey. This is Miami to Hurricane Irma. This is Jacksonville to Hurricane Irma. This is Jacksonville to Hurricane Dorian. All these observations indicate that upon the hazard was over, cities reverted immediately to their pre-event activity. So they manifest this inherent resilience at the at this mega scale, at the metro scale. Okay? And then you go to a conclusion. So this is, is, is a good reasoning, but can be falsified. Maybe, maybe there is a city that doesn't do this, right? But inductive reasoning, and maybe I should say since it's a low voice, is exactly what machine learning does. Right? Machine learning follows an inductive reasoning. They do, they establish a pattern recognition, but this pattern recognition may be falsified, right? So let me give you an example. Lionel Messi is an eminent soccer player who has a tattoo, right? During the World Cup final, every soccer player had a tattoo, pattern recognition. So then you go to the conclusion, every soccer player has a tattoo. This is not necessarily true. I mean, maybe it's hard to find someone who doesn't have a tattoo, but it's not necessarily true, right? So machine learning is a primitive route to reality. But today, also, I offer you something better, what is called deductive reasoning. So what I offered you is I first looked at an existing theory. What is the existing theory? Is the quantitative theory of Brownian motion, right? which tell us that no matter how complicated is the way that the Brownian particle exchange forces with the surrounding fluid, the result is always the same. The mean square displacement is a constant times the creep compliance. For those who don't know, the creep compliance is the time history of the displacement for a step force. Okay, the time history of the displacement, so you have a system, you apply a step force, and you look at the time history of the displacement. There's a neighboring function that we use in bridge engineering called the relaxation function. The relaxation function is the time history of the force for a step displacement. And then I formulate a hypothesis that maybe cities behave the same as Brownian particles immersed in any fluid. And I adopted this relationship. I construct a mechanical model that predicts exactly what I observe. And then I use the model to conclude that large American cities are inherently resilient. So I'll stop here. And I will thank you for your patience and attention. Thank you. Thanks, Nick, for the nice presentation. Uh, so I will open the floor for uh, the audience. So if you have any questions. Yes. Thank you. 
Thanks a lot. This was really this was really interesting. I really appreciated this perspective and sort of this, this way of thinking of it. I'm wondering, a lot of the examples you drew were, were hurricanes that were destructive, but not like super destructive. I'm thinking here about like uh, Hurricane Katrina, where the structure of the city changed afterwards. Yeah. Like, so I, I haven't been to New Orleans in a few years, but the last time I was there was 10 or 15, 10 years after Katrina, yeah. and there was still disruption. And I'm wondering, where is that boundary? And can you quantify where that boundary is between a, like, and I don't want to undermine Harvey, Irma, or we're all very, very destructive storms, right? But there still seems to be some sort of. I, I did you see exactly what I'm saying? There's, there's a difference there between between those types of events, and I'm wondering if you can quantify that. So, so, the, so the, this is a very good question. And first of all, le, let me tell you, we have data, cell phone data. So we buy data from companies, right? So we buy this data. So these companies have cell phone data only down to 2017. So I cannot go to Katrina. But you're absolutely right. There are, first of all, let, let me tell you that what I present today is a linear theory. It's a linear theory, right? So in other words, if I go here, before going to my amplitude modulation model, if you capture only the daily frequency, is this model here, okay? But you don't have to go to Katrina. Just go back to, two, to February 6, 2023, where we had the Turkey shortwave. And there was this, uh, the city of Antakya that was totally erased from the map. So this, what I present today is not going to work to Antakya because 60% of the population moved away. In other words, in terms of structural mechanics, this spring here yielded very badly, right? So, there is so much you can do with a linear theory. But somehow, if you look at the scale of large metropolis, so Dallas, you look at a population of 5 million people. You know, uh, Houston is like 4 million people. Within the metropolis scale, what we conclude here is that at the end of the day, even after bad things, people find ways to go where they have to go. And I think this is a positive measure because, you know, all these last 20 years we had uh, resilient offices, our fire stations have been upgraded, uh, people have been, like, uh, first responders have been trained. So all this background work somehow shows up to this mean square displacement. So this means the mean square displacement encodes all this progress that we have done the last 20 years in fortifying our cities. But I totally agree that there are cases when you have really bad things, when these spring yields, you cannot apply any more of these things. Or you have to come up with other things where you cannot use superposition. Every time you have something nonlinear, superposition is gone. OK, uh, any other question? Thank you very much. Uh, I have one question regarding the mean squared distance metric, because um, that gives you an average sense or ensemble average. Is there any way you could look at like geographic distribution in that are certain areas of your city more resilient than others? Okay. And so, so could you look at like a variance or something like? I don't. So this is exactly what we're working now. So, okay. so if this is. Uh, uh, if this is the where, where is the truck here? Maybe this one. If this is the city of Houston, let's say, right? So the city of Houston is very easy. It's like almost a square, like this is very So there there are counties or neighborhoods that suffer heavier than the average damage. Right? So in what I have presented today, this is not unveiled. So now what what my so this is the PhD study, the, the PhD subject of one of my students, is to look at communities that have suffered heavier than the average damage and to distill ideas only from these communities that you know from reports and records that they suffered harder than the average damage and see how these communities 
reacting and how the mean square displacement of these local communities reverted back. And the good thing, I mean, the, 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 the strength of my model so is, is that, let me, let me go here so you can, so the strength of my model is that I can choose the width of my excitation to be such that the recorded and predicted mean square displacement synchronize. So for this to synchronize, I need a certain duration. Then I know from the news and from reports what was the duration of the actual excitation. So by subtracting the actual duration from the duration that I need to, to create the synchronization, I can have a very accurate estimate of the recovery time. Right? The, the, this is the power of that mathematical model. I mean, the power is not that it predicts the obvious, that after the, the, the shock, the post-event response was the same, the, the post-event behavior was the same as the pre-event. Is that I can tune the duration of my excitation to synchronize the, the recorded and predicted displacement. Can uh, this be used to look at what happened during COVID and afterwards? OK. OK, so uh, in the beginning, I said that there are two, two definitions of resilience. One is engineering resilience, and one is ecological resilience. So I give the definition of engineering resilience, which is, again, the ability of a system that is under steady state equilibrium following a shock of small duration to revert back to its pre-event response. And there is ecological resilience with something different. Ecological resilience is the ability of a system when subjected to a prolonged shock, like COVID, an economic downturn, a war like Ukraine, right, to adapt to the new conditions, right, and convert itself to a neighboring system that will move to a neighboring equilibrium state that will endow the system to survive the, the shock. So it's a, it's a different concept of resilience. So ecological resilience has the concept of adaptation, adaptation and evolution, whereas engineering resilience has nothing of that. You have an earthquake, boom, the city suffered the earthquake, now you know, we have to uh, uh, move on with our lives and uh, uh, continue with our jobs. So this will not apply to COVID or to, to a pandemic or to, to the war at Ukraine. OK, any other questions? So I may have a question. So yes. it's with respect to modeling. Uh, from my understanding, I can see that this model works pretty much similar to a self exciting system, right? So over time, it's the system, it's like the city is self exciting itself, so it keeps going forever. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, when you have a hazard, uh, it's like a point where you remove the energy from the city, right? This is why you go pretty much to zero, and then you recover, right? Yes. During the pause. Uh, it seems that uh, this motion okay use this constant model but i'm um, just just want to know for instance if we can gain some advantage if you use some uh, smoother function for this pulse because it seems that for instance if you consider before uh, right before the pulse which is good for an earthquake for instance uh you have some kind of uh, events or some you are diminishing let's say the amplitude of the oscillations so can we use, for instance, a smoother function for a hurricane and, uh, for instance, a more uh, abrupt function for an earthquake? So yeah. different functions for different hazards, I mean. Yeah. Do you, can you so, take advantage yeah, of this? So the, I, 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 I understood totally what you're saying. So uh, why, why use a rectangular part? So I look also at Gaussians, right? Mm -hmm. But Gaussians ha ha have tails. But Gaussian has a tail. Uh, yeah, here it is. 
So a Gaussian ha has a tail, meaning that, uh, I'm sorry, me me meaning that uh, there is some warning for the earthquake. But there is no warning for an earthquake. An earthquake happens abruptly, right? And more or less, there is warning for a hurricane. But people, uh, unless there are evacuation orders, they have a tendency to be in denial, right? <laughs> so, so uh, it so happens that for these short duration uh, hazards, like earthquakes and hurricanes, even winter storms, that the Gaussian is not, is not a, a good shock because of the tails. Mm -hmm. A tail means that there is, uh, the, there is some, um, some information that you can use, but you have no information that an earthquake is happening. But even if it's clipped, eh? even if it's clipped if in it's the tails, uh, for instance, yeah, if you, you, you a, a Yeah, you can play with these things. Yeah. You, you, you can play with these things. But my, my goal, as I said, is not to predict the obvious. My mm -hmm. goal was to develop a machinery to synchronize to synchronize the post-event response recorded and predicted so I can have an accurate. I want to create a mathematical tweezer to extract the recovery time. Uh, th this is what I was trying to do. Great. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? It's OK. Thanks, Nikos. Thank you very much. <laughs>